thing that for everybody else to bear in mind is that these cycles tend to play out the same way. So it tends to start with crypto spring is Bitcoin dense. We then start transitioning later spring, and it seems to be always DeFi season. I don't know why, but DeFi season starts taking off. Welcome back to Crypto Insights. In his latest interview on Wolf of All Streets, Raul Pal provides insights into the cryptocurrency market and shares his perspective on the upcoming market trends. He starts by highlighting the normalcy of market corrections during bull markets, drawing parallels between the current cycle and previous ones. Pal emphasizes that, amidst the market noise, the main macroeconomic thesis supporting the digital world remains unchanged. He discusses factors such as increasing digitization, growing interest from investors, positive capital flows, and supportive business cycles, asserting that these fundamental aspects overshadow short-term fluctuations. The conversation shifts to the potential impact of the Bitcoin ETF. Pal predicts a rally leading up to the ETF announcement, followed by a period of consolidation as the masses adopt and launch it. He believes this development will further drive institutional interest, especially among retail investors. Pal shares his cryptocurrency portfolio, primarily denominated in Solana, with Ethereum as his second choice. He anticipates a significant catch-up for Ethereum once the Bitcoin ETF is finalized. He explains how a portion of speculative capital from the Bitcoin ETF may flow into Ethereum, potentially causing a substantial price increase given Ethereum's smaller market size. The discussion expands to cover the broader cryptocurrency market cycle. PAL outlines the typical progression from Bitcoin dominance to altcoin season, followed by NFT and meme coin madness. He predicts various psychological and market trends, cautioning viewers against FOMO and advising prudent risk management. PAL concludes by presenting three potential outcomes for the market cycle, a regular cycle, a front-loaded cycle driven by ETF retail demand, or a massive bubble cycle akin to the 2013 market. He stresses the importance of avoiding excessive leverage, practicing patience, maintaining wallet hygiene, and exercising caution in the rapidly evolving cryptocurrency space. We will bring you the highlights of this interview, so please don't forget to subscribe and liking the video. The 2015 to 18 bull market, we had 11 20% pullbacks or more. Many of them were 35, 38%. In the last cycle, um, from the 2020 low, not even the 2019 low, from the 2020 low, we had eight corrections over 15%. Some happened in a day and some happened over three weeks. So it's normal. My Another mantra that I have when you're in the middle of a bull market that has the macro behind it, is it's all fucking noise. It's just noise. And so, you know, has the main thesis changed? Is the world becoming less digital or more digital every day? More. Are investors who aren't exposed to it getting more interested in it? Yes. Is there capital flow coming in? Yes. Is the business cycle supportive? Are liquidity conditions supportive? Yes. In which everything else is noise. So it doesn't change anything. It actually gives it a higher probability of rising. And it gives it a higher probability of rising because you flushed out the leverage. It's high funding, we'd have had to sell off after the event. Now we can have a rally and maybe a cons sideways consolidation before it actually goes live, right? So we've got announcement and then live date. And then the masses need to be mobilized. And so there's going to be waves of, of that happening. So my general mental model could be dead wrong is we rally into it rally after it sideways consolidate for you know a month while everybody starts launching this thing the tickers come out you know you can start trading it and the RAAs go around talking to their clients and then by March it all starts going batshit crazy I've always said it's a function of price so if price, you know, last year was the best advert you wanted for an ETF to launch. If you'd have launched the ETF in November 2022, you'd have raised 30 million bucks and everyone would have been embarrassed. Yeah, like the future. You raise it after future. Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's done 150% last year. That's pretty interesting to people. Um, so now, are the institutions going to use the ETF? Mostly not. It's mostly the RAAs. It's really for individual investors. Um, so those pools of capital 
and the individuals, it makes it just super easy because they can just use their brokerage app or they can use their RAA because then they can get fees on top. So they're incentivized to do it. Um, will some pension funds do it? Yes, but they still really don't know how to deal with this asset class yet. And they want more regulatory clarity. I mean, it helps with an ETF. So we will we will see it. You know, one of the headlines that will come across the tape in 2024 is some monster pension fund has taken a monster sized position in Bitcoin. It's not just Bill Miller and Texas teachers. It'll be a bunch of others. And, you know, we will see those headlines. They will be the pioneers to show the way to others that you could do it much like Paul Tudor Jones was a pioneer in getting the hedge funds to start trading it because he was pretty early into into getting on board with it. Yeah, my thesis remains unchanged. So I'm mainly denominated in Solana. Second is ETH. <coughs> ETH. And like you, I think ETH has a big catch up as soon as this ETF is done. So that pause after the ETF is announced is, I think, the start of the ETH run. Because it's very simple. Let's say a billion dollars of speculative capital went in to speculating on the Bitcoin ETF. Okay, once that news is out, you'll sell. Then what do you do? Oh, the ETH ETF, well, that's going to come by maybe June. So in which case, that billion dollars goes into ETH. Now, what's interesting about ETH is it's a third of the size of Bitcoin currently. So if you put the same billion dollars into an asset that's a third of the size, it probably goes 3x more than Bitcoin did. And, you know, ETH with the deflationary asset, the more activity, the less Ether is around. And all of the staking means there's not a lot of liquid ETH around if this happens. So it could get very, very squeezy. So, yeah, I think that. And maybe at some point it'll play a bit of catch up to Solana. I think Solana beats it all cycle. But there'll be legs when ETH does really well, much like Bitcoin started off out of the gates faster than anything. Uh, then Solana caught up and well ex exceeded it. I think ETH's chance is next. For everybody else to bear in mind is that these cycles tend to play out the same way. So it tends to start with crypto spring. Is Bitcoin dense? We then start transitioning later spring, and it seems to be always DeFi season. I don't know why, but DeFi season starts taking off. Then you start hitting alt season when global liquidity starts increasing year on year. Alt season hits and ETH starts outperforming Bitcoin. And then you get some of these ridiculous uh, tail events. Also, NFTs lag. So we're still in, we're kind of like we were beginning of last year in, in crypto where some of the NFTs have found a base and are rallying. Others are still bleeding. Obviously, some of those will go to zero, obviously. But that NFT space, it really takes off when ETH goes to all-time highs. Um, that's what happened last time around. And then it utterly explodes because everyone's got money to recycle it by trophy assets. Everyone wants to buy a punk and then off it goes again. So we've got that madness still to come. We've still got another leg, meme coin madness, dog coin madness comes later still. So that's in Q2 is kind of dog coin madness to come. So all of the... The, the psychology of psychology of the degens that will play out as 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 normal plus the sensible bets of the the right layer ones toying with so here's my probability set 60 percent chance it's a regular cycle somewhat like the last cycle but maybe a bit more like the previous cycle that 2017 that got a little bit crazy i think there's a 20 percent chance that Maybe it all gets front-loaded because we get all of the retail demand via the ETF, and it actually is a shorter cycle than expected. If you think the previous cycle was actually a bit stunted versus where people's yeah. expectations were, maybe this is stunted in terms of time. The other outcome I've got, the other 20% chance, is that this is a, a gigantic bubble cycle, somewhere between the 2012-13 version and the 2015, because... Everybody can now participate and total fucking madness ensues. And I don't know which one of those three it's going to be, but they've all got a decent chance. Forward-looking indicators of liquidity going up. The business cycle following that path. Inflation falling. Look at trueflation. It, it was down at two point whatever again. You know, I still think it goes to zero. Um, and then following it will be the core inflation will keep deflating. Unemployment. Who knows? I think it rises a little bit from here. Um, but that's enough to bring the Fed into action. We, 
you know, will they use the balance sheet and print? Well, somehow they've got to roll all of this debt. Maybe they don't. Maybe they figure a different way. Maybe they incentivize the banks to take it on board. Doesn't matter. It's the liquidity that matters. So I don't see anything on the horizon that changes any of this. And if you think about one of the big things that people were worried about was China. But cut to a month and a half ago, and she's got a smiling face in California, shaking hands with Gavin Newsom, talking about, well, we should all be working together. Well, that tells me for this cycle, that's taken that risk off the table too. So, you know, where is the risk here? Don't use leverage. Today proved it. Don't trade. Don't overtrade. Just hold. Have patience. If you're going to have a DGEN book, have 10% of your assets in your DGEN book. And keep off DeFi. Don't go out trying to lend stuff for fancy returns because you get rug pulled if you're not careful. You've got you've added a layer of risk, and before you know it, you don't own your co coins anymore, and the game is over for you. So don't do that. Also, look, most exchanges nowadays are higher quality and relatively safe. But if you can, you should not keep your coins on an exchange. That ex exposes other risks. So you need to have wallet hygiene. Just store things on different ledger devices or whatever. Um, don't store it in one wallet. Don't use that wallet for everything because then everybody sees your wallet and you can be open to a scam. So just do that and, and just don't FOMO into the shiny thing because that is a sure way of losing money. And just step back. Let the madness ensue. Have a smile on your face. Watch it, but try not to get caught up in it. If you do, use your 10% of your book to get caught in the madness so you can laugh at yourself because I guarantee that 90% of you will lose 90% of the money in that book. Some will, some of your friends will make the 100x and you'll, you'll be always thinking, I can be them. You won't be. You never will be. So this was Raul Pal and his view on potential outcomes for this cryptocurrency market cycle. He stresses the importance of avoiding excessive leverage, practicing patience, maintaining wallet hygiene, and exercising caution in the rapidly evolving cryptocurrency space. Feel free to share your thoughts and engage in the discussion in the comments section. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space. Thanks for watching.